Test, test. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So if you are still out there in the lobby area, please try to make your way to Uber Auditorium so we can start um, this adventure today. How is everybody doing this morning? Awesome, that's what I want to hear. So, my name is Pamela Frederick. I am the student counsel for Multicultural Affairs. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am from Micronesia, specifically from the state of Pompeii. I would like to welcome you all to the ninth annual Celebrate, Educate, and Appreciate Diversity conference at EOU. We will begin by taking a few moments and humbly acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land Eastern Oregon University is upon. The Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Nespers people. We celebrate their traditions, languages, and stories. We acknowledge their continuing connection to this land, water, and community, and pay our respects to these original stewards of Northeastern Oregon. Our acknowledgement of the indigenous people of this land reflects our commitment to a culture of inclusion and respect that begins with those who were here first 
and whose continued presence is important to our future. So hey everybody, good morning everyone. My name is Andrea Camacho and I am the ACLU Student Government Director for Diversity and Equity. I'm a student mentor as well as another student leader and I'm also a member of the 2020 C Conference Planning Committee. I am from Saipan of the Northern Mariana Islands and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Hey, what's up? <laughs> We also want to take a moment to recognize that February is Black History Month. Black History Month is a significant time in our history as we remember the important contributions and achievements of African Americans throughout our nation's history. 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, 1920, granting women's suffrage, and the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, 1870, giving black men the right to vote. At this time, I would, like to take, I would like to invite ACLU President Sam Wegerman to the stage to give some welcoming remarks. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to see so many faces here today. My name is Samantha Wegerman. You can all call me Sam, and I'm the current student body president. I work with the Associated Students of EOU, and on a more personal level, I'm a senior this year and I've attended this conference every year since I was a freshman. As a student and an ASEOU officer, I can truly say this is one of the best annual events that EOU holds in regard to diversity and inclusion. Each year this event does a superb job educating attendees, appreciating diversity, and making Eastern Oregon a richer place to live. I also have the pleasure of introducing an active member of EOU's Board of Trustees. George Mendoza. George received an undergraduate degree in elementary education from Eastern Oregon University and later went on to receive a Master of Education Leadership from Northwest Nazarene University. George has over 20 years of experience working in education as an elementary school teacher, administrator, and coach. Prior to his current post as the superintendent with the LeGrand School District. He was an assistant superintendent and director of special education at Morrow County School District. Those close to him acknowledge George's dedication towards access for all students, and George practices deep care for our university and the Eastern Oregon region. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to trustee George Mendoza. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Eastern Oregon University, the Board of Trustees, we welcome you for uh, attending the SEED conference. Um, just so you know, it was kind of a last minute um, discussion for me to, to come up here and do a welcome. So uh, I'm going to try to wing it and say some good things. They did, they did ask me to share a little bit about uh, my own thoughts about um, celebrating equity, diversity, and appreciation. Um, so I'm going to share some thoughts. If you wanted to know a little bit about the school district and how the school district does things in terms of access, opportunity, equity, and diversity, I'm going to leave this here in, in case uh, folks someday want to look at our school district and better understand that. Um, so some things that I'd like for you to think about in terms of celebrate, educate, and appreciate diversity. Um, I'm going to share with, with you all a little bit about our own, our own lived life experience, okay? So, so I'm going to start with this. This is one of the things that I think is important in terms of, of humanity with diversity, is to be vulnerable. Um, when we're vulnerable and we share with people our own lived life experience, it opens them up to sharing their lived life experience with you, and then we have better understanding and common, under, uh, common understanding towards goals that you want to accomplish together. So with this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my name. And then after that, we're going to do a quick activity where I would like for you to visit with the person next to you and talk about the origins of your names. So my name is George Mendoza. Um, or you could say George Jesus Mendoza. But I was born Jorge Jesus Mendoza. So I was born in Mexico came to the United States, um, grew up in a small town, Granger, Washington, and somewhere in, in first grade, um, I kept, everybody called me Jorge, or they tried to call me Jorge, 
And, uh, and the teachers, after a while, were like, we don't know how to say Jorge. We don't know how to say it very well. We're just going to call you George. And we're going to teach you how to write your name George, George Mendoza. And so after a while, everything became um, the G-E-O-R-G-E -E spelling of George. All my school documents became George. Um, my graduation documents were George. My driver's license was George. All those things happened over time for me. And the thing that I would want you to know is that after a while, you just, for me, it was like my parents wanted me to assimilate. They wanted me to talk in English. They wanted me to do everything um, that the dominant society was asking of. They wanted to, to learn all those kinds of things as well. And it became second nature for me to be okay or comfortable with the name George. Well, I, I was born in Mexico, and we came across to the United States illegally. So when I was two years old is when my family moved over to the United States. And I was always told that I was born in California. So I was, what I would tell people, I was born in California, Madera, California. And so I would, I would say that until my parent, my dad got deported. And then when he, became, when he was deported, he later on told us like, I'm not a citizen and you're not a citizen and we have got to get naturalized. We've got to go through this process. And this is when I was around 10 years old. And at 10 years old, um, the Amnesty Act, the Farm Worker Amnesty Act was in effect in our, in our country. And during that time, there was a farmer that sponsored our family so that we, we could become um, alien residents. And at, if you don't know much about that, you, beco you become an alien resident. And at that time, you have an, you're an alien resident for 10 years. And then you can apply for citizenship. So that's a quick story of my name and how it became George, is that when I finally was able to become a citizen, they basically look at all your documents and they say, well, here on your birth certificate, it says Jorge, Jesus Mendoza, but here on everything else that's American or English or of, the, of this country, it says George Mendoza. So which one are you? And so I had to make a choice, and it was one of those like, I didn't even know it was going to be that way, but it's like you have to make a choice real fast on what you're going to do. And for me, it was like, well, all of my documents say George Mendoza here, and everybody that talks to me identifies me as George Mendoza. So I guess I'm going to go with George. And that, that just sealed it, and then I became a, a U.S. citizen, and everything that is of, of my name is in George, except for my birth certificate. So the, the story behind that is that I think we all have stories about our name and how they became. And there's going to be stories from when your family moved and how you were named. There's going to be stories about a country that they came from or a location that they came from or why your last name is spelled the way it is or why your first name is spelled the way it is. And now I would like for you to spend two minutes with the person next to you, one person for two minutes shares the origin of their name, and for the other two minutes, the other person shares the origin of their name. Go.
Okay, please switch partners if you haven't. Please switch partners if you haven't. In terms of the other person gets to share their origin. Okay, let's come back. Okay, let's come back. My, my hope in this activity is that you understand that there's a story. There's a story behind every person. Um, there's, back to that lived life. There's a lived life experience behind that person. And I hope that you can reflect on your own origins and your own name and the impact that it has on you and your character, but also that you understand somebody else's experience and their character and how it impacts them. Um, there's a lot of things that I could say, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do a couple more. I, I, I do think that when we think of our own diversity or our, our own humanity, that we should stay humble and open-minded and abundant in the thoughts that we have in working with others, that it's okay that they're different from you. We need to be proud of who we are and proud of our culture and proud of our heritage and proud of our family and all those other things that make you, you know, good with who you are and your self-esteem. But I think we also need to be okay that other people are different and have their own culture, their own family, their own heritage, their own religion their own beliefs, their own values. And when we stay in that open place with each other, that's where work gets done. That's where things happen that make it better for others. And so I wanted you to be aware, if, if folks do ask for my material, um, I, I'm gonna reference little things and then I'll, I'm happy to share it with Mika Morton. Um, this is a, a personality test. Um, as a leader, it, um, in the two experiences where I've become the leader of, of a larger organization, one was that as a principal, I used this. And then when I became the superintendent, I used this. And this is called the Colors Personality Style Test. And it comes from a variety of people, but Myers and Briggs. And it gets into people doing a test, and they wind up having the different kind of characteristics that make them, um, whether they have a green style or a gold style of personality or blue or an orange. And they all have different indicators of what like, that person is. And what it does is it really helps you understand quickly, oh, this person has this general type of style of work or this general type of style of thinking. And again, in organizations, like the, our school district has 330 employees, 2,000, roughly 2,370 students, about 1,400 families. And it's not like I'm gonna know everybody's personality, but they're not all gonna be green. And they're not all gonna be gold, and they're not all gonna be blue. And so what we have to do as best we can is try to accept or understand each other's style and figure that out, come from that perspective, seek first to understand, then to be understood, that comes from Covey. And then you work with them, and then they hopefully understand you as well, and you create better. And that's, that's uh, in a gist for me, um, what I share with our staff or I share with the people that I work with, I just, I just want better. I want better all the time. I don't care if it's schools, I don't care if it's sports, I don't care if it's facilities, I don't care if it's roads, I don't care if it's our organization, we just want better. We just want to keep getting better and you have to think about those kinds of things so that people work together. 
Um, I wanted you to know a little bit about an, another thing for me about appreciating diversity or, or caring about each other. And there's a book that I read called um, The Book of Joy. There's times in our work, I think there's times in our life when we're just giving and we're doing a lot and we're not um, as happy or we're not as satisfied as we want to be in the things that we're doing because we're just drained. So for me, last, last school year, I needed to read something that brought more joy to my life, something that kind of made me a little more happier. So I got the book of joy. And there's a concept in there called mudita. Mudita means um, cultivating shared humanity. And so with, with that concept, it was like, if we all treat each other with humanity, dignity, compassion, respect, understanding, less shame, less blame, less judge, and assume the best intentions of everybody, that is our best state of being for being at peace and for being okay with how the world is or how others are too. And so we need to practice those kinds of joyful practices. Um, I would want you to know that like if you, if you want to live in this joyful place, the Book of Joy also talks about living life with great perspective. And I, I would say this, for me, one thing I think about as a leader is I, I, I don't get to live life like every day thinking about day-to-day -day everything. I wind up thinking at about a 10,000 or 20,000 foot level and I think about the system. I think about the people in the system and how the machine is working, how things are operating in the system. And that to me gives you perspective. It doesn't always bring you down to the moment of how things are happening, but it allows you to see like, well, if this took place and that took place and that happened, then this could be better like that. Because you want perspective, because that typically helps you to solve problems at a higher level. So think about perspective, live life humbly or with humility. Try to find humor as often as you can in this world. Live life with acceptance. These are joyful practices. Forgive. Forgive people as often as you can and live, in a, live a life where you, where you do those kinds of things. I know it bogs you down to just stay in a place where you're not happy with people. Think of things that you're grateful for. Practice gratitude activities. All it, all it means is if you, even if you wrote down 10 things that you're really grateful for and you, read, and you review those things often, or if in the morning when you wake up and you just think your first thoughts, what are three things that I'm grateful for? Maybe it's your loved ones, maybe it's that you're okay and you're healthy. Maybe it's that you're going to do something fun that day, who knows, but having those kinds of thoughts. And living life with compassion and also with generosity. The last thing I'll leave you with for me, um, we're always kind of on this journey of growing and becoming better as human beings. And lately I've been trying to think about um, bias, or we can say prejudice. Um, or we can say other things that, uh, you know, folks think in a more negative way. Um, and I'm just going to say this. There's a lot of conscious and unconscious bias that we have. Sometimes people say implicit bias. Um, and I guess I want, I want you to be very aware. Um, for me, implicit or unconscious bias is you know, we, we all have preferences. Even if we just use that word, we all have preferences. I prefer steak over chicken. I, I, I prefer having a truck versus driving a car. I guess I prefer uh, red or salmon over blue. I don't know. There's just always things that, that make you who you are, uh, and those are those are conscious or unconscious, those are, you know, implicit biases. I prefer action movies over romance movies. You, you have all of these things, and, and if you call that your preference or that you call that, that that's how you think, that's, that's okay. And I think the more we acknowledge that, that's okay. Um, sometimes we have gender preferences. Sometimes we have religious preferences. Sometimes we have first impression preferences. Sometimes we have stereotype preferences. All these things happen, 
And that's, again, a normal part of being a human based on where you live, based on the religion that you have, based on the friends that you, that you have. All of those kinds of things are normal. And I'm in this spot of like, it's okay. But we have to be self-reflective. We have to be honest. We have to be vulnerable. We do have to try to live life abundantly with generosity, with forgiveness. And that to me is a, a, good, a good place to be for the work that we want to do with one another. So I'll leave you with that. Um, very thankful and grateful that you're all here. I hope we all learn today. Thank you so much, Mr. Jorge Mendoza. At this time, I would like to quickly go over the schedule for the day. We will begin this morning with our keynote speaker, Alex Martinez, and there will be two workshop sessions. Session one start immediately after our morning keynote. We have five workshops that you can choose to attend this first session. All workshop classrooms are on the east side of this building. After session one at 11.50 a.m., lunch will be served, and we will have a special keynote speaker, Dr. Emily Drew, who will be presenting the lunch plenary at 12.10 p.m. Please get your food and come back into this room where we will hear her speech. At 1.10 p.m., session two will start. We will have different workshop topics from session one to allow you to participate in a variety of topics. After the second session, we will all meet here again for a 20-minute thank you and closing session. If you get to a workshop and it is full, please choose a second option. Okay, so in your programs, we would like to go over some housekeeping and highlight the community agreements in the front page. That's allowed. <laughs> so we have a fun day planned for everyone to engage in learning, conversations, and activities around diversity and inclusion. To help you develop a framework to engage in the conference and network with participants, we have posted some community agreements to keep in mind as we go through the day. They are listed in the program to help ensure openness, maximize participation, and encourage respectful and meaningful dialogue. Please use these as guiding principles as you go through the day. Some things I would like to challenge you all with as you participate in the workshops are being fully present. So being fully present means you are willing to not check your phone and to give your speaker your full attention in order to maximize this opportunity to listen, to learn, even when you feel confused or uncomfortable. We ask that people reflect on their own social position, your class, your gender identity, sexual orientation, legal status, body, etc., and be an ally to more people who are more mar marginalized than you are. Allyship is about actively reframing knowledge and actively uh, changing power dynamics. Thank you. Also, pay attention to your reactions. Watch your own emotions and pay attention to how it may influence your interest in hearing new information. When something triggers us in a way that may not be comfortable, we haven't missed critical parts of what is being said. If what is being said creates an emotional response in you, be extra aware and challenge yourself to listen and be open-minded to hear the full intent and meaning of what is being shared. Also, ask questions, engage in dialogue, network, and connect with someone you don't already know. I challenge you all to make new friends, and most of all, have fun today. So today at this time, I have the privilege and the honor of introducing our keynote speaker for this year's 2020 C Conference, Alex Martinez. Alex Martinez is a poet and organizer living in Kansas City. Born in Veracruz, Mexico, Alex migrated to the U.S. at a young age as an undocumented minor. They often write about trauma and social issues that affect them and their community. Some of Alex's writings have appeared in the Harbor Review, New City Community Press, Hawaii Review, Samila's Publishing, and About a Place Journal. Alex was an artist in residence for Charlotte Street Foundation. This 18th month residency was funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Alex published their first book, Disclosure, Confessions of a Queer in Crisis in April 2018. 
In December 2019, they were selected to participate in the Writing Guild Initiatives workshop in New York. Alex performs with Resistencia, a brown and queer, queer group of poets. Alex is a DACA recipient, and they are the current director of Kansas Missouri Dream Alliance, KSMODA, a pro-immigrant group seeking equal opportunities for undocumented youth and their families. They also organize an ACE for the ACLU of Kansas. Alex is a recipient of the Dream Lead Institute Fellowship created by Trinity University and the Hispanic Heritage Foundation for immigrant leaders in communities across the country. Through Alex's lived experiences and training, they're able to facilitate conversations about identity, power, and privilege. They serve in multiple boards, including Latino Foundation for Arts, Oral Health Kansas, and the Latino Writers Collective. Alex occasionally hosts a local community radio show called Global Roots Radio. The purpose, as well as, uh, as, well as Alex's life mission, is to uplift immigrant voices in the United States through art. So let's all give a warm welcome to Alex Martinez. Now, no. okay, is this on? Just make it closer to my face. Can you hear me? This is this gonna be interesting. Good well, good morning. Should I just use this? Okay. Okay, testing. Now, <laughs> testing, 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 testing. Uh, hear it. All right. Testing, can you hear me a little better? It won't go up any further now. Okay. Um, I can, I apologize for my voice. I think I got a cold, so stay away from me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but come talk to me if you want to risk it uh, later. Um, I'll try to speak up. Uh, my name is Alex Martinez, as you heard on that long introduction. Um, I, you want me to use this? I think I should use this. It's a lot better. Um, apologies. Well, as you heard on my introduction, um, I'm queer, I'm brown, I'm undocumented, I'm unashamed of all of that. I am unapologetic and I got a lot to say. Um, but first, I want to acknowledge all of you. Um, I see some familiar faces. I was here last year, um, I stopped on my book tour. Uh, it was really great to see a lot of people, and it's great to see some of you here today. Um, again, um, I appreciate the organizers of this conference for continuously making the choice to upli uplift voices like mine, um, and you know, specifically diverse voices and experiences. And I want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate George for being vulnerable and sharing your experience with all of us. It takes a lot of courage to do that. Um, and I want to thank you. I want to thank you for making the choice to be here because you didn't have to. Unless you did, still thank you. <laughs> Maybe you're getting some credit or something, I don't know. Um, so did you catch the word that I use? I use the word choice. Um, and it's an interesting word. It means the act of selecting or making a decision when faced with two or more possibilities. So let us pause for, for a moment and process that together. You and me, everyone here, made that choice to be here. We made the choice to educate ourselves and grow together. We made the choice to celebrate one another, but more importantly, celebrate how different we are, like George mentioned. So I want to do something really quick. Um, well, it might not be quick, but who cares? Uh, I got time. Um, turn to your neighbor whoever that might be, on one side, and say, I appreciate you. <laughs> say like you mean it. Okay. So now turn to the other neighbor or the neighbor behind you or in front of you and say, I celebrate you. Nice. That's wonderful. And that's all I want to say to you all. 
I appreciate you and I celebrate you. So now let's keep talking about choices and opportunities or the lack of them too. Um, how many of you have heard, because this is a hot topic, I'm gonna talk about it. Um, how many of you have heard of the book, American Dirt? Raise your hand. So I see a few hands. So I took some notes, so I'm gonna be reading, don't judge me. You can, but who cares? Um, so if you didn't know anything about it, let me tell you. There has been a lot of conversations on the media and other social platforms about this book, mostly in a very controversial way. The novel focuses on a story of a Mexican family. The main character name is Lydia. Um, Lydia's husband is a journalist who gets in trouble for exposing a cartel leader. Her husband is murdered, and so their journey off the United States begins. She and her child become one of the thousand of undocumented immigrants attempting to cross the border and find sanctuary in this country. I want to discuss first who wrote the novel. The author of the novel, American Dirt, is Janine Cummings. She is a bestseller, or at least she says so on her Twitter account. <laughs> she really has that. You can go look it up. <laughs> uh, but she is a bestseller. Uh, Mrs. Cummings wrote this novel even when she has no connection to the immigrant experience. Her grandmother was uh, Puerto Rican, which is still a United States citizen, therefore not an immigrant. I have to be honest with you, I have not read the novel yet. But many of my peers have and have written um, and have written about it, and it didn't take long for them to unanimously declare that there were many flaws with this book. It's not written thoughtfully. It is not based on research, and it saturates stereotypes of us Mexicans and perpetuates these ideas about us that are simply not true. Many have said that this novel should have not been written in the first place. But others argue that because a white woman wrote it, it will reach a new audience that did not care to pick up any books with our complicated and scary last names. I want to be clear on what I'm saying. I think there's an issue with who wrote it, but we should instead focus on how it was written. Because a lot of other people have written about, uh, about subjects that are not theirs. And they have done it thoughtfully and they have done it well. And we should also focus on how the publishing world becomes complicit to this act. We need more Latinx stories published, period. But not only the publisher is complicit, people in general, people in this room too, can become complicit on the erasure of indigenous people and people of color. Our stories become telenovelas and a work of fiction that is so far from the truth to be honest, we are never the default. We're always that psychic that dies first, that psychic that can be tossed away and there's absolutely no consequences. Think about what I'm saying. What choices have you in this room made to uplift someone like me, someone like your neighbor? This month, this week, Today, what choices have you made? We must do better by our vulnerable populations. We must let people own their own stories and, to, and let them tell them. Because before Mrs. Cummings wrote this book, many authors like me have written many versions of this novel, but people in power did not care to listen. Think about the power and the privilege that you hold. Think about your influence. How do you show up to the world? Do you go on acknowledging, without acknowledging that and constantly oppress others without intention? Let's recognize it and do better. We all must ensue in this journey. I am passionate about what narrative gets out about people like us because it matters. It really does. What is told in the media about people like us 
sometimes it's, sometimes it's just really hard to listen to. Many of us grow up with ideas that are fed by the systems uh, that we navigate every day, the systems that George mentioned earlier. The same supremacist systems we should be fighting. I hope you understand that this message is not just for you. I am part of that system as well. I grew up with biases and prejudice, and it has taken so long to undo all of that, and I'm still on that journey with you. So this message is for myself as well. So let me tell you a story that is not fiction, a story that I know very well, and it's my story. I was born in, as mentioned in my long, boring bio, I was born in Veracruz, Mexico, or Mexico, uh, in January of 1991, uh, to Victoria Martinez and Guadalupe Contreras. And don't worry, I won't share the whole chronological story of how I got here, but I think it's important to acknowledge some facts, some things. Um, I know some things that you can understand where I come from. My father left before I was born. My mother is a strong woman who tried really hard to raise my two siblings and me. From a very young age, I understood what hard work was. And more importantly, I understood hard choices. She made the choice to have us left with our grandfather, with our grandmother, or with anyone that had space to take care of us. Well, she would work really hard. Quite honestly, I didn't know what poverty was until I came to the United States and uh, realized that people lived in a home with their parents. That was quite shocking, um, but that was not my experience growing up. Life was really not easy and especially when she made the choice to migrate to the United States. She was out of luck with multiple jobs that led to low wages that were not enough to feed four people. I resented this decision for a long, long time. And at some point, finally I understood that that was the right thing to do for all of us. I had no idea what my mother went through to get to this country until it was my turn to do it. Oh, there's... So in 2005, uh, I was a teenager already. More specifically in August of 2005, I stood in front of a violent river Two days before that, I had left the only home I knew. My grandmother, who I love dearly, and as far as I knew was my only mother since my biological mother had left six years before that. At the time, I didn't understand why I was facing that river, why I was in that place. Um, I didn't understand the purpose of the journey either. Why would anyone risk their lives to arrive to a new land that did not want them? The things that happened in that desert were terrible. It's really hard to imagine what happened there. And you can imagine with me and we can, I'm gonna share some things, but I'm not gonna share all my story because it really is traumatic. But imagine a teenage person exposed to the elements of an unforgiven summer desert in Texas. It was over 100 degrees every day. They say everything is bigger in Texas, but so is the suffering. I walk miles and miles of rough terrain only to find nothing. And I must say that I did this uh, with people I didn't know, with four other men who I was not familiar with. 
every time a border patrol car will drive by us, we will jump and hide in the di in ditches and brushes. The thorns penetrated my sunburned skin, and I just had to take it. I could not scream. They would find us if I did. Imagine not having food and water and finding a trail of empty jugs and thinking that that was gonna be my future, that I was never gonna leave that desert. The nights were cold and unforgettable. I would look at the stars and wonder so many times just why. The cold nights I miss, those cold nights, I miss the warmth of my grandmother's body. Her warmth was replaced by snakes, cacti, and men who wanted to collect a paycheck and who didn't have a good heart. No child ever should have to experience that. But let me be clear, no parent should ever be criminalized for wanting to be reunited with their family. When I see what's happening at the border with asylum seekers, it fills me with rage, and it triggers those deep, dark memories of a confused teenager wondering where they were going. I was so lucky after days and days in the desert to be reunited with my mother. To be exact, it was five days. I was fortunate to have survived my journey. I remember being getting home and being 90 pounds. Um, my grandmother died a year later, but because of the lack of immigration status, no one in my family could go to her funeral. My mother's helplessness and hopelessness broke my heart. Since then, I understood what my role was. I understood that I was going to fight hard to try to fix our status by fixing the system that back then I thought was broken. I now know that that system was never broken. It was built exactly how it's currently operating and immigrants like me, are just pawns in a much larger, larger game. But even pawns can transform and disrupt the systems. I have dedicated my life to fight injustice, and I am committed to continue to do that. And you might be wondering, why am I sharing a sad story about getting here to the United States? I'm doing so so you can understand where I come from. I'm doing so so you can understand that I come with some privilege, but very little compared to many of you. And what I also want to say is that we must continue to tell our stories. These are the most powerful things that we have. I appreciate the goals of this conference. And I appreciate that you're here finding common ground with others and celebrating folks that are different from you. It is incredibly hard to find common ground sometimes, especially when we get to talk about hot issues that are ran constantly in the media to incite fear and to divide us. Issues like immigration, free speech, political affiliations, and other things like that. Let me tell you about an example of how I managed to find common ground with a woman who was not interested in getting to know immigrants. This was a fun one. As an organizer, I get to mobilize communities to take a specific action. If you want to learn more on how to organize your campus and how to make an assessment of the campus, come to my workshop later today in the afternoon, and we'll have a lot of fun. Um, so this was two summers ago. The purpose of was to explain the safe and welcoming ordinance in Kansas, 
uh, to people in the neighborhood, uh, more specifically Kansas City, Kansas. Um, the ordinance itself local limits local police collaboration with Immigration Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Um, I had walked multiple blocks that day, and by that point, I was getting to the end of my shift. Um, I decided to stop at one of the homes. Um, there was a big fence. It was really intimidating, um, but I was like, you know, it's, it's on my way, so I should stop. I knocked on the door, and an elder white woman answered the door. I greeted her, and I started the conversation by asking, what matters to you and your community? And like any, like many of us are not used to hearing that. Uh, so of course the logical answer to answer that to a stranger that's asking is like, why? Why are you at my door? After explaining a bit about what I was doing, she talked about safety. She didn't feel safe in her own neighborhood anymore since illegals have been moving in the last decade. Now, how many of you have heard white folks say that? Yeah. So I must admit it was slightly frustrating and triggering for me to hear that. Uh, I also made it a point today to wear this t-shirt today that says, no body is illegal. No human being is illegal. Also, grammatically speaking, it's not correct either, so there's that. Um, but I knew the ultimate goal was not to argue with this woman. It was not to change her mind either. It was to get her support and to get to know her and to listen to her and what mattered to her. That is a really tough job to do when she's attacking your community in front of you. So instead of getting upset, I did something else. Um, I tried to understand more about her. I asked questions like, what makes you feel that way? Um, which opened a whole conversation. And I asked another question of, have you always felt like that? And she continued to engage with me. I found out that she was not used to change. And she became really critical of the new people in the neighborhood. One of the goals of my conversation was to ensure that me and the folks behind the campaign um, let her know that we cared about her. We care about her safety. So that's why I was there. I, I explained what the ordinance will do, and although initially she didn't think police should stop collaborating with ICE, we came to an agreement that police should focus on local issues and her safety first. So I didn't change her mind about immigrants, but we had a good discussion about something we both care deeply. She ended up signing up as a supporter um, and she did everything I asked her to do. She took an action right at her door and wrote a note to her commissioner, um, which was really surprising to me, but also really, really good to see. So that happened for two reasons. One, I was authentically myself, and the other one is that I made an intentional decision to connect with this woman even when it was triggering for me. So I have not always been this way. I have not always been confident and authentic because sometimes it's just not safe for some people to be confident and authentic. So let me tell you another story before I wrap up. Um, also, do you remember how I stood in front of a river in 2005 not knowing where I was going? In 2010, I stood in front of the White House, um, and for the first time in my short life, I knew what my goal was. I knew that, what my role was in society. Um, right after high school, I understood my status. I understood the implications of crossing a desert and a river unauthorized. In Missouri, unfortunately, if you're undocumented, 
you're not allowed to attend uh, college unless you're paying international rates. And even then, the legislation uh, threatens higher education systems every year, and they even write it into the budget, which is unconstitutional, um, to not allow undocumented students. And now they're coming for DACA recipients as well this year. Um, so this is where I this is where I where I grew up, and in 2010 I was really upset about the lack of opportunity for people like me. So a person approached me and said, "You're undocumented, and you can't go to college. I'm undocumented, and I'm being blocked too. Are you angry about it?" And the question was, yes, I'm very angry. And then they asked me, so what, what are you going to do about it then? And I had no idea. So they were like, OK, so next, next, next week or so, we're having this action in Washington, DC. We're letting, legislate, we're letting senators know that they should give us access to higher education. They have the power. And it was the first time that I understood what power meant. It meant that there were people who hold it, who held it. And I could persuade him, probably, to allow me to achieve my dreams. Uh, but to get there, I had to take risk. I had to be uncomfortable and travel across the country as an undocumented person. Um, but that risk really paid off. Because although the DREAM Act in 2010 and 11 did not happen, um, I found a community of people who was really supporting me, who was really um, investing in my growth. Please find people who will invest in your growth. Find people who will cheer for you, for root for you. Find mentors that will do that for you. Ask your professors and your mentors favors, always. That's what I always do. Um, if you fast forward to 2015, I joined, that or, uh, I joined that organization that I've met in 2010 and invested me, the Kansas City, the Kansas Missouri Dream Alliance. And I worked really hard to make sure that they were funded, that they were continued to advocate that we let the community know that we were there for them and we were listening, we working really hard for them. In 2017, I was named director of that same organization. To me, that was a huge accomplishment as an undocumented person. And I did that because I'm passionate about change. I'm passionate about what happens when we tell our stories. So again, I will ask the questions. What choices have you made to create an inclusive environment for queer, for trans folks? I have been incredibly lucky to publish a book, which is titled Disclosure Confessions of a Queer in Crisis. And right after that, I understood that publishers, magazines, and other folks with power did not care to listen to our voices. So I made room for myself by just being me. I will continue to do that and honestly just live my best life. So let us acknowledge the bad on the world and take action to fix it. But let's pay attention to, do to those who are different than us. Let's uplift their experiences. Let's respect them and welcome them. Let us allow ourselves to be optimistic about the future, a future where we don't have to justify our existence, a future without papers to justify my stay in this land, a future where we are, where we are all loved because who we are but we must allow our stories to be told by those who live it. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alex. Some quick announcement before we head to our workshop sessions. Um, this conference is a public event and we'll be taking pictures throughout this, uh, the day. If you do not want your pictures to be taken, please make sure that you have a red dot on your name tag. The photographers will not take your picture if they see the red sticker on that tag. If you also indicated in the registration form that you have dietary needs like vegetarian or vegan, your lunch will be at the registration table. Everyone else can grab your lunch at the at the, this table right here in the lobby. And we hope you have selected a workshop. We can now head to our workshop. Um, the classroom for Erica Tucker has been changed to Bachelor 119, which is next to Bachelor 117.